Good morning, good afternoon, good time of day to everybody. Welcome to the MariaDB Server Fest November 2022 edition. My name is Kai Arne. I'm the CEO of the MariaDB Foundation, and it is my pleasure to have an audience at this uh, MariaDB Server Fest. The last few ones have been based on virtual presentations with at most interaction over Zoom. So now the audience here, it's not the most plentiful audience but it's an elite audience based on the speakers of this uh, server fest that is most of the speakers some of the speakers are still virtual uh, for instance we did not want daniel uh, black to travel all the way from canberra uh, so we will have uh, some virtual presenters we will actually have quite a lot of uh, benefit from having an audience and that means uh, not only does this presenter have faces to look at, but also uh, an audience which can interrupt and uh, give pose interesting questions. So at the end of the session, I will give this microphone to whoever wishes to ask questions from the presenter. So that's the format. Without uh, further ado, let us start with the first presentation. And uh, that presentation is our keynote. It is by Manuel Arostegui from uh, Wikimedia Foundation. And it started when uh, we got a fairly, I don't know whether to use the word desperate, but definitely strong email about an upgrade from 10.3 to 10.6 not really working. So with that cliffhanger, Manuel. Uh, thanks, Kai. So yeah, my name is Manuel Arosti. I work for a Wikimedia Foundation. I'm part of the um, database team. And this presentation is gonna be about how we found a bug that was sort of like a deal breaker for us because it, it was blocking our migration. Um, and we needed some help and I'm going to describe how was the process was and, and all the steps that, that we took to get the bug fixed. Um, so first, let's define what is a software bug. Uh, so Wikipedia, of course, defines a software bug as is an error, flaw, or fault in the design, development, or operation of a computer software that, cause, that causes it to produce an incorrect and unexpected result or to behave in unintended ways. That's what we know about what a bug is. I like to think a bug more like this kind of thing, um, that kind of error that you get by the end of the day when you're almost done for the day and then a crash happens or an unexpected thing happens and you're hoping that it's something that you did um, it's a human error um, or you're just looking at the wrong side and then before the end of the day you just check that error on google and all you find is a very old forum um, in 2005 where someone has the same error and no response and then you're like, well, maybe Google is tricking me. And then you look for the second link and then you still get the same. And you're in a situation where you're like, okay, now I've got a problem um, because your expertise doesn't allow you to go further. Um, that is for me a bug. And I think pretty much everyone here has probably experienced that. Um, so before going into the bug, I would like to introduce a little bit what Wikimedia is for those that are not aware of what we do. Uh, so Wikimedia is the, um, Nonprofit that um, is, um, that is behind Wikipedia um, projects. Wikipedia is the most well-known project, but we have some other sister projects that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we are around 700 people at the moment, and for what it's worth, we are hiring, including DBAs and SREs. Um, all the content behind Wikipedia is obviously created by volunteers. The Wikimedia Foundation employees, uh, we have um, no word or what's gone, uh, what goes into Wikipedia or the other projects. So some of the employees in their volunteer capacity, they do contribute, but the employees will just make sure that Wikipedia is accessible for everyone. Um, and as I was saying, um, Wikipedia is the most well-known project, but we also have um, Wikimedia Commons, which is another one is pretty well known, which is a, a free media repo. And also another one, another big one is Wikidata, which is sort of like um, structured data. But we have plenty of other words like Wikiquote is also well known or Wiktionary. All of those are um, in our infrastructure and we take care of them as well as Wikipedia. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit the infrastructure we have regarding MariaDB. This is a picture from um, the Dallas Data Center. 
So uh, some of the figures uh, for Wikipedia and the other projects. Um, first of all, all of our infrastructure runs um, with open source. We have nothing that is enterprise in production. Uh, we believe that's the way, the, the way to go. And everything that we do is public. Um, all the tasks, all the tickets that we have assigned, um, all the graphing, all the repos, everything can be done and can be checked in public. We obviously have some stuff that is private, like um, passwords, repos, and some of the tasks that are security related, they are private for obvious reasons, um, which we'll see that, would, that played also a role in how we were communicating with MariaDB when resolving this bug. Um, in terms of uh, more infrastructure side of things, uh, for the databases, we run Debian Bullseye at the moment, and we're running MariaDB 10.4, which is what we want to migrate to 10.6. Uh, we use bare metal, and we have around 320 instances. Um, in some cases, we run more than one MariaDB process per instance, but in the majority of cases, we have uh, one server dedicated per instance. So that's roughly what we have in production. We have around 10,000 wikis. Um, one wiki is normally one language, and one wiki is one database. We'll see in a second how we distribute those more or less. But to give you an example, uh, English Wikipedia is one database, and Wikicommon is another database. We have uh, two active data centers. One of them is writable, the other one is passive, but we get reads. And we have around 45 masters in total um, receiving writes. And then in terms of uh, MediaWiki, unique data, MediaWiki is the software uh, Wikipedia runs in. Um, so in terms of data, we have around 11 terabytes of metadata. We call metadata um, things like uh, user emails, uh, password hashes, options, revision, things like that. And we call the text the actual text that you get in Wikipedia or, or the other projects. And, and those numbers are like 35 terabytes unique. We have some other instances which are internal services that we use for, um, for like things like Fabricator, which is our ticketing systems, and theme and more internal things. Uh, so I'm talking only about MediaWiki unique data at the moment. This is an example of a topology. We use traditional master-slave replication. Um, that is a screenshot for uh, Orchestrator. And the way we distribute things is based on load. For example, in the, in the corner there you see S2. We call that section two. We have eight sections, and each section holds um, a certain number of databases. For example, uh, English Wikimedia, English Wikipedia lives in, in S1 and is so big and has so much traffic that we cannot share resources. So English Wikipedia, Wikicommons, and Wikidata, they are so big that we have to have resources only for them. In the case S2, uh, we hold other wikis that are a little bit smaller and are fine sharing service with other ones. Um, so we try to distribute the load based on how big the wikis are or how big we project them to be. So this is an example of S2 uh, where we have, I think is um, Dutch Wikipedia, maybe even Polish Wikipedia, I don't remember, but um, something like that. We can see both data centers clearly defined, and the blue one is the active one, the one that is getting rights, and then the yellow one, which is a little cut, um, is the Dallas one, which is passive, but it still has reads. And now, um, getting into the mix a little bit, how do we do migrations uh, Wikimedia? Um, first of all, we have to focus on a few things first before we decide to go for a version. And those things are basically this one. Obviously, a stability. We want to make sure that Wikipedia keeps up, up and running um, all the time. So we need to make sure that the, the version we're migrating to is stable, has no crashes, and remains up uh, most of the time. A key point for us, given the traffic that we have, is uh, we, not, we need to measure performance. We need to measure uh, if there are any big regressions um, if we change from major version to another major version. Um, we focus on the query optimizer to make sure that the query optimizer is not doing something unexpected. We have noticed between versions that there are some changes in the query optimizer. Um, some of them are okay, some of them might not be okay, so we report those. Um, in most of the cases, we need to know that there are not going to be surprises. So the main point of measuring the query optimizer is to know what to expect. Uh, okay, this query is going to be slow. Is it fine? You know, is this is slow acceptable? Yes, no, and then we decide um, how to move forward. Um, we need to make sure that MariaDB server itself performs fine, that it's not 
new options that might have um, regressions in the number of IOPS uh, or things like that. And obviously replication, we heavily uh, rely on replication. So we need to make sure that replication thread um, doesn't have any major performance or regressions. We cannot really afford lag in production. So we need to make sure that um, the new version is not gonna make us lag um, behind. We also uh, take a look into the configuration changes um, to see if there are some options that were deprecated, removed, or new options that might be interesting for us. Uh, obviously, normally MariaDB give us a heads up well enough when our option is gonna be deprecated. So there are normally no surprises uh, from one version to another. Um, if there is an option that will be uh, removed entirely in a given um, major version, we start playing with that one before to see what we can expect. Uh, monitoring changes um, is also important for us. We monitor a bunch of metrics, and if there are some changes in, for example, the show inodb status metrics that we capture, um, we have to change the graphs accordingly so they don't stop uh, graphing from, from the migration. And then an important part is the backup changes. Um, migrations at Wikimedia, given the, how big the infrastructure is and how slowly we take things to make sure that everything is stable, um, we can, end up, we can end up having two versions in production for months, let's say 10.4 and 10.6. So we need to make sure that the backups are working fine for both versions and that our tooling is working fine for, for two versions because if we run into issues, uh, it might be 10.4 or 10.6 and we should be able to recover any of them independently. So we have to test our tooling things before committing to, to migrate. And how do we do this procedure? So we have discussed, we've talked about uh, the things that we keep in mind, um, but how do we go into this? Um, so the first tests start with testing host, obviously. Um, what we do is we make sure that the process is stable. And as I was saying, we test the new and old options. We check um, if the server starts fine, it stops fine, if we need to change our puppet things, um, that kind of things that are not really in production, it will not be affecting, it's just like, the first um, glance that we took at this new version. Once we are happy with that, what we do is get one of the um, replicas or slaves in production. We remove them from the load balancer so it doesn't receive any reads. We just clone the database. Um, normally we try to go uh, for one of the big ones, probably English Wikipedia. And the reason to do that is because we're gonna have more data to analyze, more traffic. So we remove that slave from production and we just let it replicate. The whole point is to see how the replication thread works. Um, are we getting any unexpected lag? Are we getting replication broken for any reason? Um, so that is question. Do you have to stop edits on Wikipedia at this point? No, um, so to remove the slave from production, we just uh, remove it from the load balancer. Um, so people will not be able to access that server. So reads will go to all the other different servers. So this server is completely isolated. It still replicates data that comes from production but it will not be read. Um, so when we're happy with the replication thread, um, what we have to do is this same replica, which is no longer serving reads, we reply queries that we capture in production. We reply those queries into the server. To do that, we capture the traffic, we put everything, and then we measure the query uh, optimizer. Or if there's many major changes, we, change, we check if there are queries that get broken for whatever reason. Syntax, change, uh, syntax changes or things like that. Um, and then uh, once we're happy that the queries look fine, or at least we know what to expect from the optimizer, uh, we start also testing the backups. As I was saying, we need to make sure that we can recover from both uh, versions that will at some point live at the same time in, in production. So now uh, it comes the fun part. I heard that some people test in production. Obviously I never do that. Um, We'll do. Um, so we start, we need to measure how this replica is going to perform in a real uh, environment. So we have, we have seen that the replica is working fine. Then we start pulling in into the load balancer with a small weight. In case things go wrong, let's say that 100% um, 1 of the traffic will arrive to that servers. So if something goes wrong, we're not going to be affecting all the users, just those that, that go there. And the, the target is to measure the load um, real load. Now you're measuring reads on top of the replication thread, so you're giving it more things to analyze. We need to check how the server behaves with the spikes, 
and we'll see later that this was a key role. Um, there was a, a key thing in the bug that we were chasing. Um, we, we checked the optimizer in real time as well, how slow it could be with real traffic, not with just replaying queries, but with replication and reads coming from production. And again, we check replication thread that now has more load, the reads. So we start giving uh, more weight to this uh, replica. Um, going back, I have to say that for this, when we're happy with the replica, we only pull it in the load balancer for working hours. So when we stop working, we, we leave that server out of the load balancer in case something happens when the DBAs are not online. Then we have to start also testing writes. Even though our environment is more read bounded, we also have plenty of writes. So we need to check how a non-critical master will be coping with the writes. The way we do this is we don't upgrade a production media wiki master, none of the Wikipedias, but we will go for one of the internal ones. If something breaks, there's less user impact and it's mostly internal services. And we basically measure the same thing, right? No surprises here. And then it is time to upgrade a media wiki master and possibly bring everything down. Um, so the way we, up, we upgrade a master is we try to pick one of the masters that are not super critical. So we will not go for English Wikipedia or Wiki Commons or Wikidata. We'll try to go for another one that has some quite bunch of load um, and see what happens because we don't want to pick one of the less loaded masters and then find out that when we upgrade one of the loaded ones, then everything is not working. So we try to make a compromise between user impact and keep testing in production. So the last one to upgrade is normally English Wikipedia or Wikidata, Wikicommons. And now um, the fun part is how we run into 10.6, uh, this 10.6 back. Um, so to give you a little bit of a timeline, uh, we started in February 2022. We started packaging and compiling the new uh, MariaDB 10.6. And by March, we were pretty happy with the stability, nothing, no surprises. And we were like, okay, let's start doing um, some replication testing, some um, query replays, everything was looking good, organized. Um, so by late March, one month after that, we were uh, serving traffic with this host. Um, everything was looking good, some strain optimizer behaviors, no surprises, happens from version to version, nothing to worry about. Could you, as we have a live session, so what's the strange? Is it the wrong result or it just queries take a long, longer time than expected? So basically it was the optimizer picking the, like, the, like a different index that we would have expected okay. and making some of the queries slower. But no big deals, a little bit slower, but we were fine, we report them, no big deal. Um, by April 2024, uh, 2022, we were happy and we were in a position where we we're confident that this host could be serving traffic 24 seven, even when the DBAs were not online, all good, all fine. And then May, 2022, the, the summer was approaching, everything was nice. Uh, we were happy with 10.6, so we put more hosts in production, smooth sailing, nothing to worry about. And then the summer hit and we got a bug. We got some strange behaviors when we were seeing um, spike loads. These loads were um, attacks. I cannot give you more information for obvious reasons, but there were, they were attacks happening to Wikipedia and the effect that they were having in databases where the databases were getting many, many more connections and they were just, the servers were frozen. The connection would never finished. The replication thread was getting behind we couldn't even stop MariaDB. We had to kill the process. There was no other way to fix this for us. Um, at the beginning, we thought it was, it was just a one-time thing, but then we kept saying that um, with all the attacks, it was always the same pattern uh, with 10.6 servers. So we were pretty clear like, okay, something is wrong with the version. We cannot continue migrating. Uh, we need to do something. That something is normally a bug report. We have some expertise within the team, but it was, you know, we checked the, the normal things that you would check and we were out of ideas. We didn't really know what to, what to expect. Um, it was beyond our knowledge. So then we were wondering what to do um, because the, the, the picture was really strange. Like we would not be able to provide any ways to reproduce this bug, which is the first thing that you have to do when you report a bug, how to reproduce. We were not, we couldn't. Um, 
these attacks, we were not able to control them. We could not reproduce the attack even in a, compare, in a testing environment. Um, so what else? Uh, we checked all the things that we know how to check, but then we'll run, we're running out of ideas. And we could just report the bug and then hope for the best. Hope that MariaDB will see the bug, pick it up, give it priority. Um, but it was just like hoping and we were pretty blocked. Uh, we could not migrate to 10.6, possibly to 10.8 or other versions because we were not sure whether the bug would be fixed in other versions. So um, we sent an SOS. This is more code uh, for SOS. Who to approach? Um, so in 2019, I met Kai in uh, Precona Live. We had some discussions. We have been talking uh, through email uh, for a few different things. Um, so I was like, yeah, we need to we need to talk to him and, and see if they can help us in any way. Um, so we sent an email saying, OK, um, we're blocked. We don't really know what to do. Um, can you help us? Um, in no particular order, these people help us um, solving the bug. And then this is the process uh, we mostly follow. Um, when you report a bug, and you have no sort of like internal contacts, you do everything through the ticketing system um, via MariaDB, Jira ticketing system. Um, but in this case, the communication was flowing in a lot better way. I think both parties, both MariaDB and us, were very interested in getting this, sol this bug solved for obvious reasons. Um, so we also have constant communication through Thulip, which is a MariaDB internal messaging. And we were also posting um, our side of things on Fabricator, which is Wikimedia's uh, ticketing system, because as I said earlier, we try to make everything very transparent. Um, the, the key thing here was that it was an attack and we still wanted to have everything public, but we couldn't give, in, we couldn't give so much information because the attackers could be you know, getting that information as well. So that was tricky, um, but I think the most important thing was for both parties to be helping each other in this in this world. Like they were interested in us getting the bug fees. We were interested in having MariaDB be, be very stable, and both of us were, you know, happy to make sure that this was resolved, um, because the target was to have a MariaDB stable version, not only for Wikipedia but also for all the other um, users out there. Um, so the outcome was that the bug was fixed. It took a little bit like over two months um, to get everything ready. Uh, one of the reasons is that we couldn't only test things when the attacks were happening. So when Marco committed the, the, the code that was fixing it, um, he was like, I'm pretty sure it's fixed. And we were like, okay, we need to test it, but we cannot test the attacks, right? We kept having the attacks and we were seeing that the version was stable. But then at some point we were wondering whether the attack was different in any way and we were not hitting the bug or if the bug was really fixed. We were 99% convinced that the bug was fixed, uh, but it took like a little bit of time to say, okay, this now is fixed. And the, the thing is that we have been seeing these attacks. We still have them from time to time and the databases are, are working perfectly. So we're 100% convinced that it was, it was fixed. Um, for me personally, Having the back fees was, was great, but also now the bonding that we have created with MariaDB is a lot better. Um, we already knew each other, we work in a few things together, but this was uh, like a mission for both of us to get something resolved. And I think this could have not been possible without open source because everything would have been closed. Um, the, the communication is probably not as well as, as it was uh, when we were in the open source world, people would be able to see the bug, people would be able to report all the bugs, the stack traces were public, everything was, was really good. Um, and then what is next uh, for both uh, Wikimedia and MariaDB? Uh, so for us, we are now going to resume migrating to 10.6. We still have some blockers um, because we have to stop working on the normal for workflow to make sure that the bug was resolved. So we need to start uh, fixing some of the things from our side. And I think one of the key points from here, the, the takeaway points is like um, Wikimedia, MariaDB, um, we're going to collaborate more in the future. And we should, I think, because we're both interested in having MariaDB as stable as it is. And um, I've heard that there are rumors out there that uh, MariaDB wants to release, uh, is working on a tool um, to ease migrations, to see how migrations can be improved. And obviously, um, I think we would be really interested in that because as you saw, the process of migrating takes a lot of time for us. 
we have to hope for many things. We have to wait for many things to happen before we're committed to, to migrate. So I think if MariaDB is able to release something to fix and, and make migrations easier, then we would definitely be interested in on those things. Um, these are the technical details of, of the two bugs in MariaDB, in MariaDB um, ticketing system. And in our ticketing system, that is also the link to see how the investigation was going through from our side. Um, Daniel and some others also joined and helped us in, in our internal ticketing system. And that's pretty much everything I have. Any questions? So. Thank you, Manuel. Really, really interesting presentation. I think you can actually also ask questions within the audience. There are people who, who helped, so I'm, I'm here ready to hand over the microphone to whoever wishes to ask a question. And as I said, you can also ask Marco or anybody. So who, who wishes to start? Uh, I saw um, one of the very small bullet points at the end there saying you had my loader issues with uh, 10.6. Um, I'm, I'm actually the original author of my loader, so uh, we might be able to help out there as well. Do I need a microphone to answer? No, you don't. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk to you, uh, but basically we're seeing some incompatibilities with 10.6 and the my loader version that we're using. I can also point you to the ticket, which is public, where we're um, um, investigating all the issues and you can see the behavior we're having so it'd be great if absolutely you... yeah we are all yeah. willing to help cool yeah. quick, quick question so uh, regarding this bug what data did you have did you have stack trace you mentioned that yeah we we provided Marco with a bunch of stack okay so we got some information okay. yeah 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 I guess I have to <laughs> own up to my mistake it was uh, my, my code refactoring I think my, uh, it was uh, maybe 10.6.5 release or something like that. So it was not, not in the GA release, but um, s sometime after uh, I did some refactoring of the UNDB buffer pool to uh, m make the memory usage more efficient. Uh, and uh, actually my plan for 10.6 was uh, to deprecate this uh, or to start deprecating the compressed row format, which I implemented uh, several years earlier. But then it turned out that uh, actually there are quite a few users that are using <laughs> it. Uh, Wikipedia was one, and, yeah. and then this uh, next cloud or own cloud, I yeah. learned that they are actually using it by default yeah. since a very long time. So we had to backtrack on that. And um, there was a, some parameter that you, you had to explicitly say that uh, I want to write to compress tables. And the default value for that was changed. And um, now we are back, back to the normal. So it was. Uh, caused by some kind of cleanup efforts, I would say. But I think that uh, yeah, it, it was uh, very good that uh, you were able to provide those details. I mean, it was not only the stack traces, that was not enough. We needed even more like data from the buffer pool to understand what was actually going on. It was a, a quite delicate thing uh, related to uh, relocating some memory where, where the lock objects were living, so yeah. you you had to do something something strange to the locks, and and that was causing this hang. Yeah, and also to answer Monty, um, at the beginning when we were having the bug, the only way to fix the server was to kill my my RDB. So we were um, like we would lose the ability to provide traces. But after one of the attacks, we were like, okay, let's leave the servers as they are, and let's talk to Marco and Daniel on this. Um, to see what they need from the frozen server. So we left the servers untouched for like a week or 10 days, whatever they needed, so we can run all the stack traces that they needed. So basically it was total frozen and you couldn't connect to it. Yeah. Okay. So the last person answering for the audience was Marco Mackella. Prior, that, prior to that, it was Mont, Michael Videnius, and then before that, Andrew Hutchings. Further questions from the audience? Andre Elkin. Uh, Manuel, uh, just a remark first, uh, if it's back observed after this attack has uh, had finished, so can we speak here as a, about a virus? It's one thing. And second, about replication more specifically, do you use parallel replication? What kind of conservative, optimistic? Yeah. So um, the attacks are still going on. Um, it's sort of like an ongoing thing now. We are very uh, preparing all in all the layers, so it is not affecting us that much. And in terms of replication, we don't use parallel replication. We use the normal, traditional one. One. 
we haven't had really time to test. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we have some questions from the... Okay, so Vicenzo Ciorbaru will relay some questions from the audience. All right. So we have uh, a question from Jean-François Gagnier. <laughs> um, so the, the first question is, uh, this is more like uh, directed at Marco. Uh, do you think that this bug might affect MySQL upstream? No, no, I, I don't think so, even though I, I don't follow the de details of, of their development anymore. This, this was uh, related to some uh, re-implementation of, of the um, locking in MariaDB 10.6. So we have a, a few text-based uh, read-write locks on, on the buffer pool pages and, and uh, the buffer pool management, it is, uh, uh, there's a separate buffer pool for compressed pages and some cleanup and refactoring related to that, um, it, it, was, it was the cause of this. Okay, and a question for Manuel. Uh, what load balancer does Wikimedia Foundation use? So we use an internal media wiki load balancer. For internal services, we use HA proxy, but for MediaWiki, it's an internal PHP um, developed for MediaWiki load balancer. It's based on code. And open source, of course. MediaWiki is open source. Okay. And uh, uh, someone from the from Zulip is interested in the query replay tool mechanism that uh, you mentioned. So, it's basically a set of scripts that we capture traffic from the slow query logs. We basically um, capture all the queries and then replace those. It's not super. Fancy. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then you can only check like the query time. You don't check the query results. So yeah, um, once we have the queries, then we check the query time, and then if we find something weird, we go and dig into the optimizer and check the query results and all that. Yeah. Oh. It's just like a first scan. Mm -hmm. Do you have a problems with some queries being non-deterministic, like a return, you know, most popular word? What if there are two words exactly the same popular that you will get different answers potentially? I haven't seen anything like that so far. Mm. Okay. So one question for me is, um, you were talking about your upgrade process uh, initially. Um, now, at one point you, you said you measured the query optimizer. So what exactly do you measure there? Is it just the timings or memory usage, CPU usage, I.O.? So basically what I was saying is that we run a first scan and see if we have queries that are taking longer than we, they should, should take. And then if they are, then we go and check the optimizer and see if there's something like, obviously we are doing like picking the wrong uh, index on, or things like that. And then we try to run those in, in more servers just in case it was a stats problem. Um, and then if we see something like very strange, we do report that saying, okay, this index makes no sense or it's not picking, you know, whatever thing it is, and then we report those. So uh, when you upgrade to newer MariaDB versions, you, we introduce uh, new functionality in the optimizer. Like for example, we have uh, better histograms, I think in the 10.5, 10.8, uh, 10, uh, 10, okay. But we, we did introduce histograms from 10.1, 10, and those require extra commands to be run. Uh, do you introduce this as part of your upgrade process to try and test out and see if, how they- If we can, yeah, we try. Okay. And I also found it interesting that you're playing with fire process. It seems like a lot of it can be automated. Do you have uh, automation scripts you've done? Any of those can become public, maybe help others when they try to do A-B testing? So uh, we have a set of like a bunch of scripts that we have written um, just for this. Um, the problem, one of the problems we have is that we need more people in the team. That's why we're hiring um, and we need more automation. Yeah. Once we have everything, yeah, obviously it will be public. I think some of them might be public in one of the repos, yeah. So um, when it came to tracking down the bug, um, what do you think were the key metrics or data points you needed to gather to be able to have as good of an overview of what's happening? Um, so I know you're tracking like, um, let's say CPU metrics, IO and stuff. We, we use that during our debugging session. But can you do an overview of what you would consider to be the key uh, items to monitor overall for a DBA, for example? But you mean for this specific bug or in no, general? No, no, in general, what you would recommend using Wikimedia's knowledge? So one of the key things that we monitor is IO, IO weight, um, especially when we change version or we can change hardware to make sure that the IO weight is not going over the, over the top for whatever reason. Um, we also measure a lot like replication lag 
replication lag is very important for us. And then we also check how many queries are doing full scans and if they are slow, uh, because for us that could be like killing our, our uh, performance. So that's mostly what we keep in mind when we migrate. Okay, and what about uh, backups? Uh, do you have any best practices for back taking backups and restoring from backups? So um, we have now Jaime working on the backup systems and, and what we're doing the migrations. I don't know if whether your question is related to migrations or... Uh, let's say any useful information that the audience could benefit. I'm interested to hear about it. So um, the backups in, in like, a, like a big shot, uh, we take logical backups and we take uh, binary backups. Um, and we try to, we need to make sure that we can restore both of them um, when we migrate versions, not only like only ecological because those are easy to restore um, when you change versions, but we're also interested in restoring binary backups because those are faster normally. Um, so that's why making sure that we can restore both versions at the same time and the tooling work for both versions is important for us to have the ability to say, okay, imagine that you have migrated 50% of your infrastructure now you're in a position where you cannot really deprecate um, the tooling for 10.4 because you still have 50% of the infrastructure running 10.4. And you cannot start testing 10.6 because you already have 50%. So you have to make sure that both work at the same time. In case, for example, you have to go back to 10.4 for whatever reason across the whole infrastructure. We don't want to be locked um, until we are locked. So we need to have the ability to go back at any time. Okay, make, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, any more questions from the audience? I have a, a preparation for my talk. <laughs> so for your complex queries, uh, how many tables do you think that you have in those? How Guess, many tables? Uh, you have in your more complex queries. Do you have eight tables, 20 tables? That we join? Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't be able to tell now. Uh, but at the same time, yeah. I don't think we have eight, no. Yeah. So then, no. Yeah. four or five? Yeah, more something like that, yeah. So then, thank you, Manuel. Thank really you interesting. Thanks.